it's very rare that a person in my position gets to speak in a, uh, in a forum like this, and it is particularly intimidating seeing this many faces in a single room um, <laughs> listening to me. My first seminar at uh, Chicago had three students in it, um, and when one was sick, I was particularly um, <laughs> st stressed. <laughs> So uh, I, really, I really do appreciate uh, your interest, and so I hope that I can give something back to you. T today's talk comes out of a new, a, new, um, a new project of research that I'm doing, and, it's, and it began uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I was in Venice, and I'll get to that just in a moment. Um, and what I'd like to do, ultimately, is to talk about, uh, give so four episodes, two stories and two historical episodes. Um, that discuss the, the issue of uh, urban disorientation in the Renaissance. And I want to do that because um, it means a great deal because a lot of my, uh, most of my work until, um, until this moment has been uh, involved in um, the way in which, uh, the relationship between urban communities and uh, urban space and uh, how they are mutually constitutive of each other. But I want to start with, um, with this particular essay, I got my students to read this this week, and I'm really trying to make them understand why I think it's important. And Tim Ingold, who's an anthropologist, is making this thing, this is a very formative arc, um, article for me, making the distinction between people who are using maps to find their way around places because they're unfamiliar with the territory, and natives and the way that they navigate through space. And his argument was about the way which, was that wayfinding um, is a mode of storytelling. In other words, when you move through spaces in which you are familiar, what you are doing are reaching tracing uh, the journeys from the past, right, that connect you to your, uh, uh, the past of your community. You meet the world and the people in it when you're doing it, and so it's a way of, of constituting community. Um, and it's a way you derive knowledge, not just about the, the, the space within which you live, but it's a way in which you derive knowledge about yourself and its relationship to the world and the relationship to other people. And um, this was, um, and then you might have uh, noticed just recently that the Nobel Prize uh, for physiology and medicine went to three different people, who, all of whom are working on uh, a particular uh, wayfinding system in the brain, right? That, um, that these three researchers um, uh, found that there's a part of our brain around the hippocampus that constructs, uh, uses grid cells to construct a kind of a series of maps, like our own GPS position, you know, uh, system within our heads, and it's something you learn, and it's the way in which the body physically orients itself in space and can understand uh, where it is, and, it, and it, it does this by the kind of repeated motions through particular places. And so this is actually a lovely moment, perhaps a rare moment, when the humanities and the hard sciences have, are talking about exactly the same thing, but from different, within different uh, knowledge systems. And so this was uh, extremely exciting for me as well because it, um, I, uh, I'm now working on a project in which uh, I am looking, well, I was looking at the city of Venice and thinking, well, if there's anything that could absolutely undermine the body's ability to negotiate space, it would be the city of Venice. If anyone's been there, you will know this, yes. Um, I, it seems to me, it would appear to me that half the people who, half the non-natives in Venice at any given time are looking at a map, and the other half have given up looking at a map because they just can't find out where they're going. Um, and so there I was at a conference of the Renaissance Society of America in Venice in 2010. I had this great idea. I thought, okay, well, what was it like in the Renaissance to get lost? because everyone's lost in Venice. And so I figured there must have been people in the, in the 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th century that were getting lost in Venice. And I decided, I proposed to, do, to give a paper on this at the next year's conference. And um, so here, because here is a, a map of Venice, and you can see, I mean, it is a, a, a densely packed urban core uh, that has no particular kind of logical uh, design to it, right? It's a, it had a kind of a cellular growth where each island developed in and around its own particular spaces and sort of joined up uh, haphazardly with the islands around it. So I figured this would be a great place to start. The problem was uh, three weeks before the conference, I hadn't found a single person in the Renaissance who was lost in Venice of all the sources I was looking at, and I was starting to panic. So I had to leave Venice. I think the answer is that whenever you went to Venice, because it was so confusing, you're either on a boat being rowed by someone who knew where they were going, and gondoliers to this day have to pass an extremely difficult exam about the topography of Venice and its history as well. Um, and, or you, uh, if you were walking, you, you wouldn't be walking because you'd probably get robbed, apparently. 
And it, the first reference is someone getting lost in Venice. I mean, it would be a lovely place to get lost, but I mean, it's um, very difficult now because it's, um, uh, because there are so many, uh, so many tourists. But I found out that around the 1690s, British tourists started uh, ducking away from their guides on the Grand Tour in order to um, uh, dabble in what we know as the other part of the Grand Tour, which was not the cultural Grand Tour, but the, 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 the sexual tourism that was going on uh, in the Grand Tour, of which, for, which cities like Venice and Florence were particularly tolerant. So I had to think of something else, because 1690 is no longer the Renaissance. So uh, while I was in graduate school uh, in Florence, um, luckily it wasn't uh, me, but it was uh, friends of mine, ran into a woman who was lost. And uh, she uh, could only tell them that her hotel was near a church. And so I, <laughs> I've, I've mapped out all the churches in Florence here, just so you know. But she, but she, she also said, she also said that um, the, uh, the hotel had green shutters. And if you've ever been to, uh, to Florence, you'll know that green shutters and yellow walls are pretty much what the city's made of. Um, so there was, her hippocampus had not had the chance yet to begin orienting herself spatially, but it was, she was trying. Huh? She was thinking, okay, churches and shutters, right? There's something going on here. Um, it took uh, my friend several, um, better part of a, a, a day, eight hours or so, to reunite her with her, with her husband, but she's fine. But, but I, mean, I think that that's, uh, this, this is the issue between wayfinding and using maps. And in the Renaissance, there, there are no maps of cities. You don't have a map to when you, when you go to a city. Here are two um, uh, lines from a poem by Benedetto Accolti, a, a 15th century uh, Florentine poet. It is 72 lines of invectives or insults against an unknown um, enemy of his. And the first one translates to something like, um, may silver and gold and all things beautiful become always at your touch. Sorry, I'm reading it in the wrong, wrong order. Okay. May silver and gold um, and all things beautiful turn to shit when you touch it. Um, the second one says, may every creature right, take particular joy in tormenting you terribly. Um, and also within these uh, lists of insults is this, spandito sia per le contrade strane, right? May you be banished to strange streets. Right? <laughs> Big deal, right? That could be Venice, right? Um, but it was terrifying to be lost um, uh, in the Renaissance. And, and I, I think that in the, around the 18th century, it seems to me, on the Grand Tour, it was obviously something that people sought out, to be lost in a city, to, have these kind of, to run into picturesque views in the cities like Rome or Venice was something you sought after. But you would never seek after being lost uh, uh, in the Renaissance. It was a terrifying because, this is my argument, you lost completely your sense of self. It wasn't just about disorienting yourself in space, it was about disorienting yourself in terms of who you were and how you related to your community because your, your sense of self was bound up in the spaces in which you lived right, and the people who populated them. So exile was possibly worse, worse than death. So here's the first story. And it's from Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, which was written around 1352 in the wake of the Black Death in which the city of Florence had been devastated, right? Uh, of, uh, uh, up from about a third to half of the population is dying in a single summer. And the, the Decameron um, takes place um, in Florence. There are three young uh, men and seven young women who decide to leave the plague-torn city and go into the gardens of the empty villas that surround uh, the city and tell themselves stories. And these stories, they, they do this for 10 days, they each tell a story each day on a theme. There are a hundred stories in this. Um, and they are very, very funny often. But I think that um, one of my arguments about this work is that it's really a kind of a meditation on what was worth saving after such demographic destruction of the city. And um, in this particular uh, story, which takes place on day two, and it's story number five, Andreuccio goes to Naples and he's got 500 gold coins that he's going to spend and he's dying to spend it and he's flashing it around. Uh, he enters into the port, the port area of uh, Naples that you see here. Um, he is looking for a horse. And um, there is a Sicilian prostitute who decided she's going to relieve him of his money without selling him a horse. And so what she's able to do is she's able to find uh, someone in the city who knows his family. 
he's from Perugia, he's from a long way away from Naples, she's from Sicily, and somehow she, she managed to do this, and she uh, then pretends to be his long lost sister, and she gives him enough details about his life that, she, that he completely uh, falls for the story, and she invites him to dinner. Um, she lives in a place, as you can see, uh, there's the port, she lives in a place called Malpertugio, which has been translated as evil hole. Um, and so, I mean, he, he's never been to Naples, right? But he, he should have been warned by the name of the neighborhood in which she lived, but he's not. So he goes into this neighborhood, and he has dinner with her, and he is um, feeling really, really good. They found his, uh, a, a long-lost family member. But uh, towards the uh, end of the meal, she keeps him there long enough that she says, you know, it's too dangerous for you to go home because you're, you're not from here, so you better stay over for the night. So you can stay in this bedroom. So he's, he goes into the bedroom, um, and he's going to stay overnight, and he has to relieve himself, of course. And when you relieve yourself in 14th century in Naples, you go out the window on a couple of planks, right? And then you are, there's a, an alley below you, and you um, relieve yourself, and then you go back in. The problem was he was out on the planks. She shut the window, right? Uh, one of the boards was so rotten, um, it collapsed, and he falls into, as you see him there, right, um, into the cesspit. Now he's completely alone in Naples. And, of course, he hasn't figured out what's going on yet, so he goes and bangs on the door, and her pimp then uh, puts his head out the window and says, you better leave now, or I will beat the shit right out of you, literally is what he says, because he's covered in it, right? Um, and um, so the neighbors are waking, uh, have been woken up by the noises, and they say, you know, yeah, you better listen to what he says, because this is no place for you to hang around. You better just leave now. So he does, but he doesn't know where to go, because it's dark in the middle of the night in a city he's never been in before. So he goes up the uh, Ruga Catalana, and uh, he encounters um, a little hut. He enters into the hut, and he's really, really scared. He doesn't know what to do. In the hut are two thieves, but he can't see them because it's dark. But they smell him. <laughs> and they can't believe what they smell. And they find out that it's, that it's a person next to them, and they, and they say to him, you, you've got to clean yourself up. This is ridiculous. And so they take him to a well. There's no bucket on the well, so they have to get him to hold on to the rope, and they lower him down into the well so he can um, to wash himself. But along comes the night watch. and. The thieves freak out, because they're not supposed to be out at night, because there's a curfew. They drop the rope, he plunges into the well, but the night watch is thirsty, so they pull up the rope, and they think, my god, this is a huge bucket on the end of this. Um, and when suddenly, uh, Andreucho jumps out over the edge of the well, the night guard uh, is terrified, and they run away. And the thieves come back, actually looking for him, and then they say, okay, but you want to join us on our night of thievery, and so he has no other choice, so he does. And they're on their way to the, um, what's called the Duomo, the, the, the cathedral of um, Naples, where the blood of San Gennaro is. And uh, because the bishop had just recently died, and that meant there was going to be a grave full of expensive stuff that they were going to rob. And here is, uh, here's the cathedral there, there's the interior nave of the cathedral, and then there's a tomb which does exist. I mean, this is a real tomb of a real family, um, right there, of the uh, Archbishop, Filippo Benutolo. That's his tomb right here. Here is a 15th century illustration of what happened. So the thieves say, okay, you're going to get into the tomb. And you imagine a tomb like this, of course, is a big, solid stone coffin with a giant stone slab on top. So they lift up the slab, which is very, very heavy, and he has to get in, and he, they say, okay, we want this, this, such and such a thing. And he's handing them out, you know, the, the crozier and, uh, uh, and several uh, uh, expensive things that, the, that he's been buried in. And they say, don't forget the ring. And he says, I can't find the ring, because he's terrified, right? Because he thinks, well, they're just going to take all this stuff and take off on me. So he says he can't find the ring. He says, well, look for it, look harder. This being Naples, there is another group of thieves on their way to rob the archbishop's tomb. They come into the church. These thieves freak out. They drop the slab on back on top of the, uh, uh, the tomb, and Andreucho is lying naked, right, on top of a dead bishop. <laughs> Those thieves open up the tomb. He grabs one by the, the arm. He freaks out because he thinks he's, uh, the bishop has come to life or something like that. They run away. Now he is uh, out. He's got the ring but he's still lost. He manages to finally find his way back to his hotel or the inn he was staying at. He was told, you know, you are very, very lucky, and it's probably best if you leave the city now. 
And uh, just to give you the topography of, of, of this story, um, um, Boccaccio knew Naples very, very well. Um, and so the reason that this story interests me is because here in an alien territory, Andreuccio was actually saved by the city itself. Here was a city who, even it's in its most benighted spaces, right, in the places where literally, I mean, uh, uh, this, you know, the, um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, degraded neighborhoods in which this person lived, that city somehow, in a very, very uh, uh, gentle way, right, through the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the medium of the thieves, is able to give his money back because he sells the ring for 500 gold coins and to get him safely out of the city. And in a way, Naples becomes the protagonist. Even though Naples is a kind of broken city, it still has a way of being able to sort of humanely transform, right, uh, your, your, um, uh, your misfortune, right, into something else. And this got me thinking a great deal about th th this kind of theme throughout the Renaissance. So, dumbfounded by Rome, Francesco Petrarca. Um, he first goes to Rome in the late 1330s. And uh, if there's anyone in the world who knew Rome, it was Petrarch. Nobody knew the city better than he had, and he had never been there yet. But he knew its history. And when he gets there, he writes to his friend, who, uh, first of all, he, when he gets there, nothing. Two weeks later, he's sitting on the Capitoline Hill, and he's, he's writing to his friend. We have a picture of this. He's writing to his friend, uh, Giovanni Colonna. He says, you thought that I would be writing something truly great once I had arrived in Rome. Perhaps what I will be writing later will be great. For the present, I know not where to start, overwhelmed as I am by the wonder of so many things and by the greatness of my astonishment. He was so overwhelmed by the greatness of Rome that he should have already been prepared for that he could not say a thing. And for, uh, and for a moment, he was completely uh, at a loss. A person who was constantly writing throughout his life had nothing to say. But eventually, he will come back to Rome in 1341 to be crowned poet laureate. And what he does then is he uh, writes back to his friend. Well, that's how we, we know what he was doing. He writes back to his friend and he says, we used to walk widely by ourselves throughout Rome. And he recalls, and you are indeed acquainted with my peripatetic habit. Because what he remembers is they used to go on long walks through the city. And in this letter, he talks about you know, all these places that we visited. And what he's doing is he's naming places, and then he's um, uh, locating ancient narratives, right? This, OK, here, you know, here is the Viminal Hill, and here's what happened here. Here is where right, the Etruscan army was victorious. Here was where Porcina was threatening, right? Here, Lucretia died. So they're walking through the city, and he's locating history right, to topography, stories right, to space in a way for him that he can begin to orient himself in Rome. And ultimately, what he finds, and, and he doesn't, of course, get everything right, right? He's doing, a, he's doing what we would understand as a kind of uh, historical archaeology, but at a time when there was no such discipline. And so he's actually inventing right, uh, this relationship as he's going. And, um, but he gets some things right. And uh, he ends up in a situation where he realizes, you know, it's not me who's lost anymore in Rome. It's Rome itself that is lost, because these people don't know their history. And they're wandering, they're, they're wandering in a Christian slumber in this city, and they do not know their past. They, do, they cannot connect their past to their city, and therefore, they are lost. And after long days walking through Rome, he, re he remembers in his letter to Giovanni, then we used to climb right on top of the baths of Diocletian, and we'd look out at the whole city before us. And it's there he said that he insists that it's the shared itineraries through the city. So not only about walking through the city, but it was about walking with his friend through the city that they were able to reconstruct through this dialogue, right, a, a, a connection to the past. And he says that, that Rome, in effect, uh, I mean, it's not as if we, um, we are taking something away from Rome. Because Rome belongs to everyone, and everyone can participate in Rome's past in this way. So he's constructing kind of a universal idea of citizenship, right, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of Western Christendom, right, where Rome is the, the locus upon which you can form these communities through a study of its history and a walk through its topography. OK, losing oneself in Florence. This is a story about a guy called Grasso, 
uh, that was his nickname. His real name was Manetto. He was a woodcarver. Grasso is uh, Italian for fatso, right? That was his nickname. And uh, the story is about the fat woodcarver. And it is a story that is in, the Ita uh, in Italian manuscripts appended, or it's literally, it comes before the biography of Filippo Brutaleschi, who you, some of you may know if you've been to Florence, if you've seen the Florentine Dome, that's Brunelleschi. Um, it, it is a major moment um, uh, in Renaissance uh, engineering and architecture. Um, Brunelleschi, it might be said, is a person who is literally inventing engineering as he's going. He's trained as a goldsmith. He figures out how to build that dome without any centering, uh, so that it's self-sustaining. Um, but in any case, there's a, there's a story attached to his biography which comes first, in which he appears as the, kind of the, 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 the architect, so to speak. Um, and it revolves around uh, a dinner invitation um, that the fat woodcarver did not um, uh, accept. And in fact, he didn't even RSVP. And if you don't RSVP uh, upon invitation to the Renaissance, that's a huge snub. So Brunelleschi at the dinner party with his sort of intellectual and artistic friends around him says, I have an idea to teach him a lesson. And if you'll, if you'll go along with me, I can convince right, Grasso, that he's somebody else. This is kind of like the, the Renaissance version of identity theft. And uh, so at first they protest, they think, yeah, how, how could you possibly do that? He says, okay, he, he, with wise words, he's able to convince them. Um, the next day, Grasso, he lives around the baptistry here. I'm showing you a 16th century map of Florence. There's the baptistry and the cathedral there. Um, his workshop is around the baptistry, and he's on his way to his workshop when uh, some people uh, cross him in the street and they call him Matteo. And he goes, uh, he doesn't know what to do, it's, the, it's not, his, not his name. Um, and then he reaches his workshop, he goes in, and there's somebody else behind the counter. And his tools are all in a different position, and you know how that really can be upsetting, right? And this person's pretending to be Grasso. He says, no, this is my workshop. And Grasso's thinking, no, no, it's my workshop. And he's starting to really get freaked out now. So what does he do? He immediately goes into the square on the baptistry and stands there waiting for someone to recognize him. And nobody does. So he goes home. Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi has somehow gotten past the locked door of his home, knowing that his mother was away, and is pretending to be his mother, and in a falsetto voice is telling Grasso that, no, you're not my son. My son's off in the countryside, and I don't know who you are. So now, what Brunelleschi has effectively done in the very first day is uh, uh, disorient Grasso by taking away the three things, the three major things that gave you your identity right, in a Renaissance city, and that is your trade, your work, your neighborhood, right, and your family. Without that, you're basically a non-person in a way. So he's really freaking out now. And he's desperately walking around the square in front of his, uh, his studio trying to get someone to recognize him. And in, in the narrative, it says he'll take several step for, steps forward and then several steps back. So he's even lost the power to walk confidently through his own neighborhood, which is why he's completely lost. Eventually, the police come, and uh, he's arrested for debts he supp this supposed the Menteo has. So the police are in on it. They bring him, now uh, this is what's really strange, they bring him all the way down, like you mentioned, this is, okay, so there's his neighborhood by the cathedral. They bring him down to this neighborhood here. The, this are strange streets to someone who lives up there. Right? This is a, mm, almost half a mile, huh? but this is a whole other world for Florentines. Um, this is a different family structure down here. And so he, apparently there are two brothers who chastise him for, for uh, being profligate and, and, and uh, assuming these debts. His local neighborhood priest comes and chastises him and tries to get him to walk the right road. He's thrown into debtor's prison. The judge is in on it. Uh, the other prisoners don't know who he is, but they're not in on it, but they, they, they think it's rather funny as well. And Eventually, he, he, and he's at the point where he's now breaking. He's actually thinking, maybe I don't know who I am. Maybe I am someone else. And it's, it, this sort of takes place over a course of two days. And it is around this time that they finally um, they drug him, and they transport his body back to his neighborhood, stick him in his own bed. But they put him upside down, or feet, feet back. So when he wakes up, he's at the foot of the bed. He wakes up to the sound of the morning bell. 
he kind of feels his way that he's home, right? But but his but but the the, the pranksters, right, have realized that, he, that, that that it has worked, right? That he actually doubted who he was. The game is not quite over yet. But he wakes up and he's in his own house. And he thinks, okay. First thing he does, goes out again into the square. Someone must recognize me, or I'm still not who I think I am. Right? He's got his home back, but the... so he wanders into the cathedral, and guess who's there? Brunelleschi is there with his friend Donatello the sculptor and several other people, all historical persons, um, and they're laughing about this story. He overhears the story where he's taught. They they say there's a guy called Matteo who went to sleep and dreamt he was the fat woodcarver, and so Grass was thinking, oh my God. Imagine this, uh, this is like the matrix, because he's thinking, whose dream am I in, right? <laughs> who's dreaming what here? And he's completely, uh, uh, um, he's, he thinks he's going insane, and eventually the, they give up the game. They all have a big laugh. He feels shame because the story manages, this is the, uh, the nature of, of, of gossip and information in a city like this. News travels particularly fast. I mean, within a single day, the entire city is laughing about a guy who believed he was someone else, and Brunelleschi's this big hero. He's so much shamed that he has to take all his money and a horse and go to Hungary. And, in, uh, and we know that there was a guy called Grasso, right, whose name was Manetto, who was a woodcarver, and around 1409, he left Florence to go to Hungary to work for the Hungarian king. Years later, he will come back from Hungary and thank Brunelleschi for making him a rich man. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a happy ending. But, but this, what, this story, what this story does, in a way, is sort of counter the prevailing um, uh, conventional idea that the, the individual, your sense of self, is something that you derive completely by yourself. Right? So it's an anti-Freudian kind of um, 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 argument. In other words, you don't find yourself inside, deep inside. You find yourself right, in the spaces in which you live and in the, community, the communities with which you interact. They are the ones who, in, in, in the dialogue and in negotiation between bodies and spaces, help you to construct yourself. But they can also, the story warns, take that away from you because you don't fully own yourself. It's a collective ownership together. And that's what I think really what the, the Renaissance city uh, is about in terms of the way it understands the relationship between neighborhoods and, law, uh, and, and the kind of different communal structures in which you live, family, spiritual, uh, trade, and labor, and that kind of thing. And I think it's no surprise that it was an architect, right, who was at the, at the heart of the story. Because if there was anyone who understood urban space, it was Brunelleschi. Right, more than anyone else uh, at the time, which is why he's the one who is redesigning the city at the, at the urban scale. I mean, he understands, and it, this story tells us, he understands not only about what beautiful buildings are, but that beautiful buildings and beautiful cities right, are always social phenomena as well. Right? That bodies and buildings have a relationship that is uh, constituted of what the city is, right? as a social phenomenon and a collection of physical objects. And those two together, construct the city. And there's the dome there, just so you see it. A built between 1420 and 36. And of course, then the life goes on to tell you about all of these ingenious ways in which he revolutionizes the uh, discipline of architecture. And that, of course, is the city that then is understood. I mean, this gives us a new idea of how the city is made up. So that the, the architecture right, uh, uh, is also uh, involved in the construction of these different kind of local identities. Okay, next story. So we think that although that is a story, we think it actually happened because all of the people involved are real. Confusion in Rome. Here, this is a play about a play written in 1543 by Anibale Caro called Gli Straccioni, or has been translated as the Ragged Brothers. And the first scene in this play takes place in this square, this piazza, in front of the uh, Palazzo Farnese. This is the Piazza Farnese. The, um, this is now the French embassy in Rome. Um, so this would have been the backdrop. Unfortunately, this play was never actually performed, but that's a very interesting uh, uh, thing in and of itself. Uh, had it been performed, this would have been the backdrop. And the first scene would have been uh, Piluca, who is a native Roman who has been gone from the city for six years, has come back with his uh, master, Demetrio, who is from a Greek island, and they are lost. Because Piluca says, 
wait a minute, where are we now? And what piazza is this? I've never seen this street before, nor this one either. And Demetrius, don't tell me we need a compass on land too. Piluca, where's the Farnese Palace anyway? Demetrio, if it were a wine cellar, we'd have found it by now. Maybe this is it. No, it wasn't so high. You are much higher than it is. Still, it could be, in fact it is, but where's my mistress's house? It used to be right across the way. Piluca, who's from Rome, comes back and his neighborhood is completely wiped out and he doesn't recognize anything because the Pope, right, who is named Alessandro Farnese, who was a cardinal when he left, was rebuilding his family home. When he became Pope, of course, that house was far too small and so he was going to enlarge it. And so there you see the, the kind of topography of the, of the Farnese property here. Um, and Piluca is completely disoriented because what he comes back to is uh, everything that you see here in pink um, uh, was demolished by um, Pope, his name is Pope Paul III, um, to reconstruct a palace, a square, and new streets. And streets are new streets or change streets are particularly disorienting for locals. So here is local memory completely wiped out, and Piluca doesn't know who he is anymore. This was, and you can see just how, actually just how big the Palazzo Farnese is in relationship to the, to the, to the area around it. Um, Michelangelo had a hand in, in designing this. The Pope never lived to live in this because it took far too long to build. Um, but I want to say that, that this, is a, this is a comedy. It's a comedy uh, commissioned by, the, by a papal nephew from one of the leading writers of the time. Therefore, the Pope, it's an official commission, therefore the Pope has authorized this. And the Pope is allowing his own building schemes to be made fun of. The question is maybe why? What, what would be the point of that? There you hear, there, I mean, uh, there you, uh, gives you another idea of how it sits on the landscape. It was the, it was the biggest single building in Rome it was built. It's still one of the biggest ones in the historical center. Paul III um, lamented, this is him lamenting. Uh, Paul III lamented um, the, the, the amount of destruction that was going on to the ancient monuments of the city. And he also lamented the decay into which that uh, um, uh, those monuments had, had, uh, had arrived. But also, too, he had a project. He wanted to make Rome a modern, new international capital right, of Catholic Christendom, right, worthy of its history. So he has two kind of conflicting uh, um, um, plans for the physical city. Because he also has very much self-interest uh, uh, in terms of his own family, uh, interest in uh, creating a topography for himself as well. So. Uh, one of the things uh, he does is he re-erects um, the twins, the ancient twins. This comes from Greek and Roman mythology. Castor and Pollux um, are, uh, are twins, although they have different fathers, which is odd. But Zeus is one of the fathers, and they're born from eggs, and their, their sister is Helen of Troy. In any case, they are, they are um, in, in, in ancient Roman mythology, they are um, military heroes, right, that are uh, supposed to protect Roman troops. And so they are, they are the horse riders. They're known as the Dioscuri. Um, these are ancient statues that Paul III re-erects on the highest hill in Rome, the Quirinal Hill, where the president of the Republic uh, lives today. Um, and uh, they are kind of the fig they are what the Ragged Brothers have become. In other words, the ancient twins that guaranteed Ro uh, the integrity of Rome as a military uh, uh, powerhouse and, a, um, and as a functioning state had now become the Ragged Brothers, right? Um, and this was sort of a, a kind of a, uh, an allegory of what the city had become. And perhaps um, uh, and the, uh, Paul is thinking about a new city on the horizon. And there it is, you know, uh, an idea of what it looks like today, the Castor and Pollux uh, between the Egyptian obelisk. This is uh, from 1532 to 35. Here's an image of what you would have seen in Rome at the time. And so there is, there is this idea that the city is, in fact, broken. And the answer is what to do with it. And Paul III has grand plans, and they are... Um, they are, uh, on the one hand, he's going to rebuild the city. He's going to uh, conserve, preserve, and rebuild um, uh, ancient monuments. But that meant you had to get rid of a lot of the clutter around them to rebuild, to highlight them. 
Um, and it was pr particularly the kind, of the, the kind of local networks, right, in communities around the city that are going uh, under the wrecking ball uh, for his renewed city. And in this particular case, this now is going to be the triumphal road, the Via Triumphalis. Uh, and here you see several of the, um, of the monuments that are going to be uh, um, uh, restored for the entrance of a particular guy into the city. Here is a list of interventions into the city that Paul III will carry out throughout his pontificate, right? Major, major uh, interventions into the city to reconstruct it anew. Th these all involve ma major demolitions and works of preservation at the same time. So some monuments get saved and others are literally uh, burned down into lime to make mortar for new buildings. Um, Charles V, who was a Holy Roman Emperor at the time, had destroyed the city, sacked the city in 1527. Uh, uh, and it was a very, very horrific time for Romans who were traumatized by what the new Protestant imperial troops were doing to their Catholic city. Um, however, um, Charles V is going to have a triumphal entry into the city organized by the Pope, and the Pope is, go uh, is going to prepare for that by preparing his triumphal route through the city, which required him to um, demolish 200 buildings and 11 churches along the way. Um, uh, literally putting up, uh, burying some monuments in the forum by creating a, a huge level road for the horses right, to, uh, to move along. Eventually, what, uh, what will happen is he enters right, at the imperial gates here, passes by these particular um, uh, nodes that uh, Paul Luther wants to show him. He's given a running commentary on what all of these uh, different monuments mean in terms of the relationship between Pope and Emperor. He will eventually arrive at St. Peter's, right, which is ground zero for Catholicism, and there he will kiss the feet of the Pope. Um, so this is the kind of this is, this is a kind of the kind of contradictions that the play is putting forth. And the question is, had there been an audience for this play, here they are laughing. Um, what would they have thought? Because in one point in the play, let's get the quote for you here. The play offers two responses uh, to Paul's demolition preservation campaign. But the new urban magnificence still leaves him, uh, sorry, in light of this, the play offers two responses. Piluca finally relents and admits that there's no greater glory for, for a building than falling to make way for a work of such splendor. So in other words, the stuff that was there before, I mean, was honored by being torn down to be rebuilt upon by an even grander building, right? So a newer, grander city is gonna replace the decaying old one. The Ragged Brothers are gonna get new clothes, right? But the, this new urban magnificence still leaves him a displaced local left without a mistress and a home and desperately seeking the comfort of a wine cellar. However, his foreign companion, this is interesting, Demetrio, who is not from Rome, has been able to fully internalize the, the new monumental beauty. He says, what a beautiful palace. What a splendid piazza. He says, oh, magnificent Rome. Rome at this time, right, has, the majority of its inhabitants were foreigners. Locals were a distinct minority. And the new international capital that Paul III is building is going to be one that's going to have to appeal to their sense right, of the city's needed grandeur, in which case there's a certain trade-off about local identity and local neighborhoods. The new, the brothers themselves were still handsome, so they say, but they were sick and insane. And this is sort of the, the Rome Right, the, the, that, that, that he encounters. That is a sick and insane Rome that he is going to rebuild. So the, when you saw the play, right, and this is sort of what, what I'm speculating, would the audience then have seen behind all the humor and the making fun of the papal demolitions of the city, would they have seen the very serious face of Paul III who was going to say to them, you may be disoriented now, but what I'm going to give you in the future is going to be so spectacular, and you're going to see it right now in this play. Because everyone, anyone watching the play would not have seen the real building because it wouldn't have been built for another 50 years. Not even Paul saw it as well. So I think that the play was part of the urban strategy of Paul III, right? If you make them laugh about it, if you can, uh, uh, and, you, and you can take a certain amount of self-criticism at the same time, you can possibly get the city to buy into your plan, perhaps. And maybe that's true. Because here is the Capitoline Hill before Paul got to it, right? 
And here's the Capitoline. I mean, I'll show you in a second after Michelangelo gets to it. Here's the, or one of the final scenes where the two ragged brothers are talking to each other. And the, the city, uh, Giovanni says, Rome, sacred and holy, it's the Rome of the fiend, Battista. This very devil's Rome, gutless Rome, Giovanni, Rome impoverished and lunatic, and the cause of all our poverty and madness with the benediction of God Almighty. So they have given, they understand now that this uh, city has, this particular aspect of the city has no future. And of course the play ends with their daughter, Giulietta, receiving a huge uh, uh, dowry and being betrothed in marriage. She's refound after her captivity. Everyone starts rejoicing. There is, of course, this being a comedy at the end, everyone has a big feast and there's lots of merrymaking and everyone is happy. And this is something that is really, really, um, uh, what Renaissance Rome was really good at was having a party. And, and Paul III promised the city also uh, by reinstituting the, the carnival um, and uh, lavishly spending on, on, um, um, on processions and celebrations, he was going to give them the circuses that they demanded as well and that he was going to pay for it. And this was a big uh, issue as well. But what I want to say, just as, uh, as a matter of clo uh, closing, in all of these scenarios, what I'm, what I'm seeing is uh, uniting them, is the way in which disorientation um, breeds automatically um, a, a desire to move through the city somehow, to be recognized somehow. P. Lucas spends the entire play wandering around trying to, get, trying to recognize things or get people to recognize him. Uh, the ragged brothers are wandering around hopelessly lost in their own city until they're finally found with the, when they find their daughter at the end. So let me just read to you just a, a small conclusion about that because I think it, what it does is it brings together this issue of the relationship between movement, in particular walking, urban space, right? The knowledge that produces that and the communities that it forms. In these four examples of urban disorientation, dramatic urban disorientation provided the stimulus to both write about and perform urban perambulations. To overcome such disorientation through exploring the complex web of narratives, topographies, and itineraries that constituted urban experience. Getting lost in the Italian Renaissance was conquered by a stubborn refusal to remain still. We have to keep moving or we're finished. In the spirit of the cynic philosopher Diogenes of Sinope, who responded when he was in the, the Agora in, in Athens to a declaration that there was no such thing as motion by simply getting up and walking away. Urban disorientation and social dislocation was overcome by setting oneself in motion through those very dreaded strange and foreign neighborhoods. And here's the phrase, solvitur ambulando, right? It is solved by walking. Thank you very much. We have just a few minutes for a Q&A. Uh, if you want to raise your hands, we'll come to you. Is there any truth to the legend, perhaps, that Venice is the way it is in order to discourage enemies from conquering it? Because the enemies would be completely lost also, and the Venetians would be able to, to get rid of them. Um, I can't comment on the validity of the, of, the, of, the, of the legend except to say that I, I doubt it was a conscious planning issue because, um, as I mentioned, each of the individual islands grew around a parish space and, and they grew in a cellular form, but they, but they weren't necessarily trying to hook up to the next island. It just ha So you'll notice when Venice, when you're crossing over bridges, the bridges are often askew at very odd angles because the streets don't match up. So there was uh, that, that kind of a disarray in terms of early urban planning constructed that. And as you know, Venice is the only city of its kind that has no walls. So, I mean, it's surrounded by the sea. So I think both, both the, the, the canals and the, uh, the street patterns are fortuitously very, very adept at not allowing that kind of uh, invasion. But of course, what Venice had on the, on the outskirts of its lagoon, the, what's called the Lido, now, and there are only several entrances to that. What they would do is they put up chains across those shipping entrances to keep out foreign invaders who could only really come by sea because they really weren't, uh, they were never connected to the land until the 19th century. So, yeah. 
I have two quick questions. One, can one find the story of Grasso, or where did you find it in English somewhere to read? I can give you the reference. Yeah, it's been translated. Uh, there's a, several commentaries on it. And uh, yeah, I can absolutely give it to you. It's in a, if I remember correctly, it's in a collection of sto Renaissance stories by, collected by the historian um, Martinez, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-S. And uh, I think it's called a Renaissance sextet or something like that. Yeah. The other question I had is, were there really no maps in those days? Did nobody, were there no cartographers? Or there's nothing that exists to prove that they... Yeah. There are maps. There are absolutely, I mean, maps are a long, long tradition. Medieval maps in particular, of um, particularly world maps are, are what we have extant, more or less. Less regional maps but virtually no city maps. There is an ancient, uh, the, in the 16th century, they found a map of Rome in stone, partial, that, they, that the Renaissance uh, copied. Um, but there are really no maps of cities. In other words, maps weren't used to find your way through uh, space at that particular level. In particular, uh, medieval maps are stories about the history of the world located in a spatial context, right? So you'll see, you'll see the way in which the, from the Garden of Eden, the world, you know, uh, uh, the, the human narrative spilled out into the world and populated the three continents known at the time. Car modern cartography is in its infancy in the 15th century, and the Italians are the most advanced cartographers, but they, but they are looking at Ptolemy's rediscovered uh, um, geographia, and they're learning from it how to uh, measure the Earth's surface in terms of region, and uh, the entire globe. There are city descriptions, but those are textual. Yeah. yeah. Would, would you say oh, the same problems and the same solutions exist today? Uh, yes and no. I think um, we, I mean, on the other side of the Industrial Revolution, we have different kinds or maybe just different problems at a different scale, perhaps. However, one of the things I think that we can learn, I think, from the Renaissance is that, um, uh, maybe I'm, I'm simplifying this too much, but it seems to me that now we're not really allowed to talk out openly about uh, uh, people we don't like, for whatever reason, um, but it's done through other means. And urbanism can be a big factor in that. In the Renaissance, they talked openly about how much they hated each other, but they never, they never questioned the, the right of those people to inhabit the space they were in. In other words, you can complain all about your neighbors and foreigners and, and Jews and witches or whatever, but my God, I mean, you would never think of kicking them out. The first thing, um, I was working on um, complaints about noise um, in the Renaissance, and uh, generally it seems to be the reaction on the person who, like the, there's a person who talks about being in, a, in a, an apartment in Venice and you just can't stand the neighbors and all their wheezing and coughing and the sex that's going on, it's just driving him nuts. His answer is to leave himself, so, uh, but temporarily, right, to come back. So I think that's some, that, that is something that I think is reversed in this case that we can learn from. Um, in terms of I'm trying to think of something that maybe uh, give me a chance to think about uh, similarities and similar kinds of problems. I mean, there are always problems, say, of political corruption, for example, in terms of the way in which space becomes an issue of self-interest. I think it's what Paul III is in, involved in, right? He, he's making a great city and he's selling it as a universal, I think this is my argument, that he's selling it as a universal, but, be, but within that there's also very particular family interests of solidifying his family's fortunes and space within the city. In a city like Chicago, um, those kinds of things have happened, I believe, in the past, right? <laughs> I mean, so that is something that, is something that I think is very, uh, that is something I think we can learn from bo in both cases where you have I think the, the most humane um, urban um, configurations are a combination of good planning from the top, but also resistance from below. So that communities take control of where they need to redesign their neighborhoods, while urban planners are thinking about a different kind of scale and about good design. Because neither of those two things can work by itself. I think that if you just let communities um, uh, redesign their, you know, them, themselves in a kind of haphazard way, you get, uh, you get things like sprawl, or what we might call sprawl, without a kind of uh, uh, central planning. But if you allow planners to take over everything, you get very authoritarian kinds of cities. And so I think the conflict between urban, uh, more grassroots initiatives and an overall planning structure is actually very healthy. That's something I think that I've learned from, uh, from Renaissance I have, cities. I have a question all the way in the back. Um, as I was listening to your talk, there's another theme 
that I think comes out of this from the Renaissance that I've always wondered about. For example, in Shakespearean plays, there's often mistaken identity. People don't know who people are that they know or who they are themselves. And here, people don't know where they are. And I wondered if you might just talk about how that might be related in this uh, period, right. how you could actually lose your own identity as the Florentine man right. thought he might have. I, I don't know Shakespeare very well, so I'm, I'm hesitant to say anything particular about that, but except to say that misidentification in Renaissance comedy is a major trope. It's always going on. In this case, it's really connected to the, uh, to the, uh, the play I'm talking about. It's really connected to the urban sphere. The reason, or no, the reason it was never performed ever, it wasn't, we don't know why it wasn't performed in Rome when it was written, but later on, someone asked to have the copy of it to perform it in another city, and the author said no, because it doesn't make any sense to do it in another city, and now's not the time, because the time has passed. So really, it was a very much a locally, temporally-based thing. In terms of uh, misrecognition, yes, because um, I think, in a way, governments or authorities or people in power were terrified of, peop uh, of, of misrecognizing people, because you didn't recognize people the way we do. I mean, I'm sure you did, but officially, if you wore women's clothing, that made you a woman in, in a way. And that's why there were laws against that, that you couldn't cross-dress because that would mean you actually were someone else. If you dressed like a prostitute, the law considered you to be a prostitute. So in other words, your dress really made who you were, even in a legal sense. So I think that's part of the anxiety about uh, gender, uh, uh, gender, um, sort of uh, the slippy, slipperiness of gender, right, and the way in which clothes are constantly masking, and that unmasking is very, very difficult at this time. So I think it's connected to something like that. Uh, it seemed like the Farnese Palace was so important, so key to Rome and its identity. How did it become French? And is it actually rented by the French or owned by the French? It's the embassy or the okay, ambassador's I, residence? Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you for sure. I don't know when the French acquired it, but it was relatively early. Um, I don't know, but things like um, the, the family that owns it runs out of fortune. This happens all the time. They've got to start selling off assets, right? Um, if, it, if it was acquired before or in, in the 19th century, then Italy itself as a very fragile new uh, country was probably not necessarily in the business of being able to buy up lots of properties or take over state institutions. I'm assuming it's rented, but I don't know for sure, but you're right, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for Thank attending. You very much.